All right, so I'm gonna share my screen real quickly. So um, I wanted to welcome you all um, here for our second lecture of our um, COIL exchange with scholars from the United States uh, and here uh, in Lahore and Pakistan. So today's uh, topic is going to be the geopolitics of Kashmir. And I, we were very, very honored uh, to have uh, two very distinguished scholars that we'll be uh, presenting. So the um, lecturer for tonight um, is TJ Ligori, who is a professor at Florida International University. He's currently the Khalid and Diana Mirza um, postdoctoral fellow um, at, uh, at the university. Um, he holds a BA in IR, uh, MA in IR, uh, MA in Asian Studies, and also a PhD in International Relations. Uh, he has an interest in international political theory, international historical sociology, Kashmir and South Asia, colonial and decolonial conceptions of the international. And his uh, doctoral thesis uh, focused on uh, the uh, discourses, geopolitical and civilizational regarding territorial claims on Kashmir. Um, so he has taught South Asian uh, studies and politics uh, at FIU, and um, he is now currently sort of spearheading the Pakistan Studies Initiative um, at the um, Mohsin and Fawzia Jafar Center for Muslim World Studies. Um, so that's really wonderful. And then uh, we will also then, um, after Professor Ligori, our discussant for this evening is going to be Professor uh, Muhammad uh, uh, Shari Kazi, who um, is currently a lecturer at the University of Punjab. Um, and he is a certificate and merit holder um, in strategic and nuclear studies from National Defense University in Islamabad. And he is a scholar of um, issues reg regarding defense, counterterrorism, nuclear strategy, and security issues. So we're really honored to have both um, distinguished scholars here today, um, as well as colleagues uh, from Pakistan, from the United States, and all over the world joining us. So um, thank you so much. And with that, I will turn it over to Professor Lagori, um, and I will highlight you. So whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. So thanks to uh, the Lahore University of Management and Technology for hosting me and uh, Dr. Akhtar for putting this all together. This is uh, remarkable and something that um, we'd like to continue. And uh, as part of the Pakistan Studies Initiative, we'd like to kind of foster these uh, links. Um, so apologies if my color is a little bit off because I'm using virtual background. Um, but uh, my, so my research was based on um, Kashmir looking at discourses of geopolitics and more particularly within the critical geopolitical vein, which emphasizes um, the way in which geopolitics is not simply a taken for granted um, set of rules that are determined by a geographic location and spatiality, but rather rules that are made and remade and shaped by uh, particular power arrangements. So, uh, what I'm primarily looking at with respect to Kashmir is the way in which Kashmir has been framed territorially and how Kashmiris have been framed as people. And my research was um, particular from the period of 1846, which was when uh, the treaties of Lahore and Amritsar were signed, which effectively gave, uh, well, created the princely state out of the uh, former fiefdom of um, Uh, out of the former um, kingdom of Golab Singh, uh, Dogra um, monarch. So the Dogra dynasty then uh, consolidated the princely state as a suzerain ent entity of one of the princely states of uh, the British Raj. Um, not formally part of the British Raj, but a suzerain entity. So uh, just to go into a little bit of uh, what the research is constituted of, what my opening questions into this uh, were, were that um, one kind of um, uh, an opening intervention was that uh, I was looking at mutually reinforcing 
discourses of civilization and geopolitics in the form of imaginative geographies, particularly drawing on the work of Edward Said and um, via Said uh, Michel Foucault. And um, I'm looking at this in the way that these combine in such uh, a manner as to display a strong continuity with the colonization of the British Raj in the form of a liberal imperialism into the post-colonial era. So uh, what we see taking place, in, when I'm talking about Kashmir, I'm primarily talking about the Indian side of the, uh, the border, the Indian administered uh, section of Kashmir. And I'm looking at, at it as a continuity of uh, colonial um, rule. So um, again, taking cues from Said and Derek Gregory in the imaginative geographies, the colonial present. So the way in which not only just the particular situation of Kashmir, but the broader international system is structured so as to promote uh, territoriality of states, uh, what John Agnew calls the territorial trap, so that our conceptions of states and peoples and entities are um, more or less shaped and constrained by a territorial imagination, um, which is solid and rigid and is uh, inherently exclusionary. There's an inside and an outside and that stops quickly at the border. So state-centric uh, international politics becomes self-reinforcing and self-referential. Uh, further, the international is made up of a field of forces that exerts this power differentially, this field of forces is historically and continually constituted by power structures which express themselves materially and in the form of rules uh, and norms. Uh, so power suffuses uh, the materiality and uh, the regular. So this combines, this all combines in a unique uh, way so as to create a, an insecure uh, situation for formerly colonized states, uh, which are hyper defensive about territoriality and um, by virtue of that territoriality about their identity. So that sparks this hyper defensiveness and uh, this insecurity, this what uh, Shankar and Krishna calls this cartographic anxiety about the border. Um, so all of this together, looking at sovereignty and territoriality as linked in a uh, geopolitical being slash identity, which requires stabilization and uh, ossification. So moving into the particular um, study of Kashmir, the uh, my, my own um, investigations into this, I, I did two um, field trips in uh, 14 and 15, and spoke to a number of um, pretty high ranking uh, individuals involved in human rights organizations and in um, kind of uh, non mainstream politics and also in mainstream uh, politics as well. Um, Ali Mohammed Sagar and the National Conference. Uh, there's also uh, Mirvai Zumar Farooq, there's Yassin Malik, Said Ali Shagilani, who's recently departed. Um, and a number of Parvez Imraz, a number of other uh, figures in Kashmir. So um, my own study then led me rather in, from uh, analyzing the present. And I, I don't think that I really need to go into too much detail about the situation in Kashmir, especially since 89, but there's been over 70,000 people killed. It's a continual state of occupation. And um, despite the changes in government, although this most recent change is actually very worrying, not much has changed about the condition of occupation uh, in the Kashmir Valley, and that is palpable. Uh, you can walk up and down the streets and you see a number of these uh, posts which have chicken wire and um, rifle butts, uh, you know, pretty much just visible um, or, or barrels as of the rifles so they're sticking through the wire. Um, so this led me into looking at the original way in which Kashmir was framed uh, from 1846, from the time of the establishment of the princely state. And actually just before this, this gets put into a broader project that the British end up constructing um, in 
in combination with Orientalists, German Orientalists and other Orientalists, uh, but particularly situated in India regarding um, an ethnological project um, that they undertake, which is simultaneously racial and philological. So um, what ends up taking hold is a way to kind of construct who exactly are the British Indians and how are they differentially constituted. So a number of subnationalities end up uh, becoming scripted, uh, the Kashmiris being one of them. And the two ways in which we see this first being um, enunciated is through uh, two genres of writing, one of which is travel writing, which is always um, at the very in incipients of this, this period, it's linked to uh, geopolitical strategy. So we see this period of the great game taking hold in 1831 in which Kashmir and the Prince of the State play a really important part because of the location uh, just on the other side of the Bahan corridor, um, specifically in Hunza and uh, the Gilgit areas. Um, now, uh, there's the Morkaroft and Trebek expeditions in the 1820s. There's the Jacques Mont uh, expedition in the early 1830s, uh, and a number of other um, Godfrey Vine uh, travel writers go through. And what they do is they write these texts, which are almost encyclopedic in scope because of the ways that they're trying to make this information about. Uh, Kashmir and Kashmir is more broadly available. So Kashmir becomes this a huge focal point in the aftermath of uh, the Treaty of Amritsar and the defeat of the, the Sikh Empire in 1846. And it becomes a point of anxiety for the British to um, physically control, uh, to stabilize the border. And this also leads to a um, much more writing being done on on Kashmir and on Kashmiris. And one of the approaches is again, the philological approach, which seeks to stabilize the Kashmir within this um, broader understanding of the Indo-European language family. Now, this always had a racial connotation uh, written onto it uh, from the time of the late 17th, from mid 17th century and into the late 17th century when there were connections that started to be made between um, the Persian language and the European language um, by a number of uh, writers, uh, Thomas Boxhorn, uh, Claude de Sermes in the 1630s and 40s. And this was used as, uh, by the time we get to the late 18th century and the rise of racial, racial sciences as a way of determining differences between um, uh, Indo-Europeans, as this would come to be framed by William Jones uh, in 1784, and Semites, uh, which were broadly um, Hebrew-speaking peoples and Arabic-speaking peoples. So there was an implicit Semiticization of uh, raciality put onto Indian Muslims, which then led to uh, a historical ethnology, which created this understanding of India is being originally populated by Indo-Aryan or Indo-European speakers who were later invaded by outsiders who were Semitic speaking. So this then was further written on to uh, the ethnologization of India as having originals and then uh, later arrivals or invaders. So when we get to philological studies of the Kashmiri language by figures like George Grierson in the later 18th century and uh, um, Gottlieb Leitner uh, also in the later uh, 19th century, what we see them doing is uh, comparing the speech of Kashmiri Hindus and Kashmiri Muslims. And when they're doing this, they look at the borrowing of loan words. So there's an explicit, very clearly written um, authenticity put onto the speech of Kashmiri Hindus because they seem to borrow less from Persian or from Arabic than the Kashmiri Muslims. 
So in a lot of the scholarship that ends up emerging in Kashmir, uh, in this Orientalist period in the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, the Kashmiris are always um, seen as uh, fundamentally, uh, well, the Hindus are the more authentic group of people. And the Muslims are seen as people who later come into um, Kashmir and then uh, uh, mix with the population, but are seen as less, less authentic. And that's at first written on to their, um, uh, their language. Um, Dr. Akhtar, you had a question? Oh, sorry, I, I see that. No, 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 no. Um, so going going back to the um, um, ethnologization, this is also written onto the history chronicles. So more than anything else, we see this in the reinvestig or the investigations of the Raja Tarangani of Kohana, who's a 12th century uh, historian of Kashmir, who writes this you know grand history of uh, Kashmir, which also brings up um, into um, uh, the sites of the Orientalists, a couple of other um, Puranic texts, um, the Vishnu Dharmadara and the Nilamata Purna. And what these are looked at are as authentic um, versions of Kashmiri hi history. Uh, these are written in a vein which is more seen as more legitimate, more accessible, and privileging veracity in the manner that the Orientalists. Um, um, find easy to read. Uh, the, then as we get to the later Raja Taranganis, uh, as well in the Orientalist study of these, um, also, we see also an implicit uh, privileging of Kashmiri Hindu um, history as opposed to Kashmiri uh, Muslim authenticity. And we see this with um, the figure of um, it was variously called Lal Dead or Lalashvari, who's this um, mystical figure who uh, who really uh, ex expounds this form of mysticism, which is very heavily influ uh, infused with um, and influenced by uh, Islamic as aspects, uh, and this is due to her uh, association with Shah Hamadan and a number of other figures in the late 14th century. Um, and she is uh, pretty much the preceptor to um, Nundaresh Rishi, who's also looked at as the progenitor of the Rishi movement in Kashmir, which was a Sufi organization, which um, expounded a particular sort of, uh, of mysticism uh, in the 15th through the 18th and 19th centuries um, in Kashmir. So interestingly, uh, when Grierson and Barnett and a number of other Orientalists are looking at Law Dead, what they're looking at is Law Dead is situated within the Bhakti movement, is situated within a Hindu um, mysticism of the 15th century, rather than uh, making that linkage with uh, the Islamic mysticism. So there are boundary lines being drawn between religiosity, between ethnic lines, between um, um, uh, different forms of, uh, of identity. Um, and then this is all written on to um, this gazetteer writing. So in particular, I was looking at the Bates gazetteer and the, um, the hunter gazetteers, the imperial gazetteers of India. Um, as these, these just huge uh, compendia of uh, regional um, geographies and ethnographies and histories. And um, what we see in the Bates Gazetteer is that there is the replication um, of this um, form of Orientalist scripting of Kashmir's. It was a Hindu place. It was invaded by Muslims uh, later on. It's majority, it's majority Muslim. Uh, now there's an authenticity that is more kind of uh, Hindu in orientation. Um, and there's also this um, focusing on the need to stabilize the princely state against potential invasions from Russia as the, the gazetteer comes out in 1873. 
and there's a heightened insecurity during this period of what's called the great game in geopolitics. So there's a need to stabilize uh, the area. And uh, this is also during the period internally when we're looking at the domestic politics of Kashmir of, um, of monarchy. And there is a complete absence of um, even uh, popular presses. Uh, there's, a, there's an absence of democratization and the higher appointed offices are almost exclusively Hindu. And not, not only just Hindu, they're not even Kashmiri Hindu. They're mostly uh, either uh, Dogra uh, coming from Jammu or also Punjabis who come from outside of Kashmir or elsewhere in India as well, coming into the higher uh, kind of echelons of the Dogra um, offices, although there were a few um, Kashmiri um, Hindus but not very many before about the 1880s or 1890s when we get um, the reign of Pratap Singh. And then we also have a period where the British take pretty much emergency control over Kashmir, direct administration for 16 years in order to implement a number of land reforms and uh, administrative changes. But the entire time that the British are putting into place these policies, they're doing so with a straightforward recognition of the differentiation of groups of people which end up creating structures which further um, differentiate elements of the Kashmiri population. Uh, Hindu elements of Hindu Kashmiris and Muslim elements of Muslim Kashmiris, certain spaces are uh, then delimited as being either Hindu or Muslim. And this is a period of changes uh, take place during this British administrative period in the 1890s and early 1900s. Um, again, simultaneously happening uh, with the excuse of this uh, frightfulness over the frontier and potential um, uh, Russian invasions. And this is manifestly evident in the, um, in the gazetteers, like the Bates Gazetteer, which meticulously details 87 different possible entry points for uh, Russian forces through various passes in the, the princely state. Um, so as we get towards, so my dissertation, this is really really just setting up the colonial period and the colonial way in which um, the British sought to eventually, and they did this throughout uh, all of uh, British India, uh, differentiate who were the Muslims and who were the, the Hindus, um, determine distinct histories. And this follows largely from the, um, the framing more or less that, um, James Mill lays out in his History of India in uh, 1870. So that there are distinct periods of history. This is the way that Indian history is approached. There's a Hindu period and then there's a Muslim period, uh, largely conforming to the uh, dynasties in North India. Um, and then by the time we get to the anti-colonial period though, the way in which the international structure is set up after Versailles is um, done in such a way as to privilege uh, the states as territorial entities and nations as uh, distinct units. So this push for national self-determination requires an enunciation of a nation as a stable, identifiable uh, category. And this is, you know, following from a lot of the liberal pronouncements of the of the Versailles period of Woodrow Wilson's period. Um, and in the British Indian um, vein, this was seen as a reason to withhold recognition of independence or, or um, recognition of nationality, which would lead to independence uh, from uh, the Indians who were being ruled over by the British because they're seen as being multiple different uh, identities, multiple different nationalities and not having one stable uh, identity. So this pushes the anti-colonial project in a direction which requires it to enunciate itself as a distinct nation. And we see this with um, Jinnah's two nation theory. We also see this with the Nehruvian move towards the recognition of, uh, of an Indian nationality. So um, there's a lot of different possibilities that I explore uh, during this period of the early 20th century, which is broadly pan-Asianist. Uh, there's pan-Islamic sentiment. There's a lot of different um, ways in which this is enunciated that are 
really interestingly explored by Chaudhry Rahmat Ali, who lays out you know, his conception of Pakistan as uh, being, which is not actually really seriously taken up by many uh, of the dominant political actors, but is seen as uh, being this wonderful mixture of all of these different people, which transcends raciality. Uh, and this is uh, laid out in the, the early 30s in, um, in uh, Chaudhry Rahmat Ali's uh, work. So the, um, the push for Indian independence and the push for um, uh, the creation of Pakistan is then framed in this term where there's this need to delimit nationality. Um, now this is happening simultaneously uh, with this Kashmiri push for democratic reforms within the Dogra system, uh, especially given that uh, 90 odd percent of um, the Kashmiris and then broadly throughout the empire, probably closer to um, two thirds or three quarters of, uh, of the princely state being Muslim. Um, so in the push for these democratic reforms, uh, we have the 1931 agitation and uh, there was not quite yet this, this formal enunciation of, of uh, Kashmiri identity, but pushes were made in the form of um, uh, the state subjects, um, Jammu Kashmir State Subjects uh, Act, uh, which basically gave rights to uh, property ownership to uh, Kashmiris rather than people coming from outside. And it should be noted that even though Hindu nationalists today um, decry this uh, legislative move as one which is uh, discriminatory to Hindus, this was pushed by Kashmiri Hindus against um, Punjabi Hindus and other people from outside of the princely state who were coming in and buying up uh, properties. And it's also um, allowed for uh, the creation of a little bit of rep uh, representation um, in the early 30s and for entry into administrative uh, governmental posts um, at the same time. Um, but this is pretty much the backdrop to what eventually happens with the granting of independence. And I'll move a little bit uh, further now. But in the aftermath, uh, and now I'll just move to like the Indian policies toward Kashmir of independence, there's again a wavering on the part of the Dogra monarch uh, for over two months. And then in October, he uh, signs an instrument of accession, which was eventually his, was, was uh, recognized as his uh, um, accession to um, India. Now, this was um, done by a monarch who was simultaneously bat battling um, uh, uprisings and calls for democratic reform from within uh, his princely state uh, on the part of both the Muslim Conference and of the National Conference led by, led by uh, Sheikh Abdullah. Uh, in the aftermath of the uh, Indo-Pakistani War of 47-48, um, we have the um, the line of control, um, the the demarcation line between you know what was Pakistani uh, portions of the former princely state and what was recognized as the Indian portions of the former uh, princely state, and then you had the establishment of more democratic rule with the form of the national conference, which was not actually in fact the way that they uh, ruled. Um, recognized as, as being entirely and legitimately democratic, given that many of the seats that they controlled in the parliament, which was an independent parliament that was attached to India by virtue of Article 370 of the Indian Constitution that was written into um, there in 1950, which gave a special, um, what's called asymmetrical federalism, a special sense of autonomy for the princely state. Now that was gradually whittled down and eroded uh, throughout the 1950s and 60s uh, with the removal of Sheikh Abdullah uh, and with um, the establishment of, um, uh, with the removal of the, the separate kind of um, titles because it was a president and a prime minister, and this was then relabeled governor and uh, chief minister in line with the other Indian states in the 1960s. But interestingly, what we see intellectually is that this, this, um, this reinvigorated scholarship for um, Kashmir ends up creating this kind of 
Kashmiriat identity by the 70s and 80s. We see like the formal framing of it being used in the 80s and really not before then. But it's interesting how that maps onto Indian conceptions of nationalist uh, history. Um, and really interesting when we start looking at the, the monarchies. So that when we look at Sultan Sikandar, who was a Kashmiri monarch from about 1389 to 1413, he's seen as more or less as the analog of um, Aurangzeb. And when we get to Zain Abidin from 1420 to 1470, he's seen as the analog of uh, Akbar. So in a nutshell, the um, the creation of Kashmiri identity is contested and it's um, being worked on from a number of sources which always have an implicit politics with it, either pro-Indian or anti-Indian. Um, but by and large, what we see the Indian state doing in the aftermath of the 70s and 80s is trying to um, write onto its identity an uh, inherent Kashmiri identity uh, which would justify the secularism of the state itself, or from the Hindu nationalist perspective, um, would require the state to ex exercise more uh, direct control over it, uh, which calls for its recognition of the Hindu history of, uh, of Kashmir. So that's really given a lot of the like, context of the aftermath of the, um, the revolt of 1989 to the present. Perfect. Thank you so much, Professor Lagori. That was a great history um, of the identity sort of challenges of Kashmir. Um, so now I'm, I'll move this, uh, we'll move on to the discussion from University of the Punjab. Again, um, uh, Professor uh, Kazi is an assistant professor in the Department of uh, Political Science, University of the Punjab at Lahore. He has a doctorate in international relations, focusing on nuclear diplomacy in South Asia. Uh, he holds a Certificate of Merit and Academic Excellence from Strategic Nuclear Studies um, from the National Defense University in Islamabad and is author of the book, Escalation Patterns in South Asia, Future uh, of Credible Minimum De uh, Minimal Deterrence. So I will um, now turn it over to Professor Kazia to discuss it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Iqbal. And uh, TJ Ligori, it was a very, very comprehensive discourse on how to understand Kashmir, not just as a generic territorial issue between two or three states, but rather as an ethnic and social issue uh, that is something of a dimension that we usually miss. But if you direct yourself to the line of inquiry on the chat that you see, a major contention uh, that I had in your discourse was also that geopolitics or the geopolitical reality of Kashmir has two dimensions. The first dimension is the pick and choose that has been made by major contenders and participants into this particular issue in how they see Kashmir territorially and how they understand the dynamics of Kashmir and the people of Kashmir within that territoriality. So the idea is that if you're from India and your basic purpose uh, from the government of India is to deter Pakistan, then Kashmir has a very different meaning. August 5th, 2019, it has a completely different interpretation. So if you're sitting in Beijing and you're really concerned about territories in the Ladakh and the Aksai Chin region, Kashmir appears to you in a different context. The ethnicity, the territoriality of it, the uh, religions involved suddenly change the premise. And if you're somewhere sitting in Islamabad and you're looking at Kashmir and your idea or your agenda is appeasement of one partner and aggravation with the other, Kashmir automatically transforms into a different unit. And this is the pick and choose you've uh, very elaborately discussed in your argument, in your presentation, that this is not something which is new. It's something that has been there ever since Maharaja Ranjit Singh, Maharaja Gulab Singh, and the entire political dynamism of the domestic politics and power struggle within the Kashmir territory has, has taken its roots into it. Now, I see Kashmir and the geopolitics of Kashmir in a different lens. For me, uh, primarily maybe because that's how the introduction of the Kashmir issue uh, was made to us here in Pakistan, or that's what the discourse is on the other side of the border. As far as the colonial era is concerned, up until 3rd June 1947, whatever was happening inside Kashmir was, yes, ethnically a very big issue, religiously maybe a very uh, tumultuous situation, territorially not that serious. So the geopolitical angle of Kashmir prior to the 3rd June 1947 Mountbatten discourse uh, 
was something of a domestic civilian civil nature that did not have that geopolitical uh, kick to it, that geopolitical, uh, let's say, the voltage of the geopolitics of Kashmir was very low. But come 3rd June 1947, and you see General Option Lake and General okay. Douglas Gracie having a disagreement, and that disagreement so, right? culminated uh, into okay. the inertia between these two states. Uh, you find yourself in a very different premise altogether. That's the first time the geopolitical reality of Kashmir is introduced uh, okay. beyond the uh, ethnic concern, uh, okay. beyond the uh, idea that the people living inside this territory or the conglomerate of territories have something to do with the political discourse of what we are trying to discuss right now. So 14th August uh, 1947, Kashmir is introduced to us as a territorial issue in its entity that it has less to do with the religions and the ethnicity of people residing in Kashmir and more to do with the territorial demarcation of what was previously known as the subcontinent. And now that you have that, that's where, uh, for me, John J. Hearst, Butterfield, and Jervis's spiral model comes into effect. That if your idea is to look at Kashmir from a geopolitical lens, then there is going to be either one of two things between the partners or the collaborators or the participants to this issue. They'll either yeah. be chain gangling or they'll be buck passing. And in that spiral model, we yeah. saw yeah. that yeah. Yeah. Or whenever this third party intervention was made play and the geopolitical reality of Kashmir at the international yeah. forum was taken seriously, there was this buck passing. In order for us to avoid the war, we would switch to third party diplomacy, claiming that we do not have the bilateral diplomatic yeah. spirit all the diplomatic vacancy is so dominant here in these two countries that Kashmir's geopolitical situation can be uh, sent to a third party mediator for amicable dispute settlement. Now, whenever you're looking into the geopolitics and you're ignoring the ethnic reality or the demographic composition, you're making matters worse for the issue. If you consider or if you take a glance at the United Nations resolutions the choice to opt out of Pakistan and India is not available to the people of Kashmir. But when you come into the 70s and the 80s and you start to realize that this freedom struggle has now changed from choosing a side to making yourself as a regional actor, to make yourself as a more important cogent player in the game, is something that has now even further complicated a very complicated issue. That brings you to 5th August 2019. The general acceptability between India, Pakistan, and the people of Kashmir that this is a conflict in continuity. I would not like to call it a perpetual conflict because I do not believe in the idea. All conflicts do come to an end. So this continuity of conflict further clarifies to you the idea that geopolitics is no longer about the ethnic recognition. It's much more about how each player would interpret yeah, yeah. the lands of Kashmir in its own yeah. national interest and their own dimensions. Add nuclear weapons into it, the nuclear dimension, yeah. the triangular nuclear deterrence between Pakistan, India, and China. Now you have a flashpoint, and that is what Pakistan and India in their literature usually refer to when they're talking yeah. about Kashmir, that you're at a flashpoint. And now you add the very recent Galwan Valley incident where China has activated itself into this particular issue, not with the same veracity as Pakistan, but with a veracity nonetheless. You find out that the idea of geopolitics now takes over the territoriality of the conflict as well. So this transition from Kashmir being an ethnic issue to Kashmir being a territorial problem, and then from being a territorial problem to, to being a deterrence issue, and from being a deterrence issue to being a legal problem, it is what complicates the idea of a solution of Kashmir. So whenever uh, with the grip that you have on the historical trajectory of the issue and with the contemporary approach that we in nuclear politics usually take, if you ask us the answer to these questions that is there a solution to the Kashmir problem inside? I think, and I, 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 I think I'm not the only one saying this, that the answer to this question is far more technical than one could imagine. And I'd just like a comment from you. Do you really think that this transition 
has occurred between the stakeholders uh, in the essence that the territoriality of Kashmir and the ethnic composition of Kashmir yeah. is now eclipsed yeah. by the fact that each state has this political rhetorical claim to the lands of Kashmir and those claims grow and squeeze with the political requirements of those stakeholders. I'd like a comment from you on that so we can get the ball rolling in our discussion and then move that conversation forward. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Um, uh, so, so two questions of um, possible solutions and the territorial dimension. I, I didn't get too far into the territoriality of the kind of uh, present dimension, but my claim's a little bit um, stronger than, than uh, just kind of mere ethnicity. And it's not even so relevant to, uh, in, uh, to Kashmiri ethnicity as it is to an Indian sense of identity and how those borders are written into the very fabric of this Indian national project. So it kind of provokes this hyper defensiveness over the territorial borders. So that the territory and the understanding of the identity of the Indian state are written onto each other. Now, this has kind of undergone uh, a very palpable shift since tw even before 2019. I think that many in Kashmir saw 2019 eventually coming after 2014 when Modi um, took the prime ministership. So I'm very uh, worried about Kashmir. I'm very worried about uh, increased Indian occupation. I'm, unless there's a, a very, uh, a very discernible shift in the rhetoric, in the policies of the BJP party um, in Kashmir and elsewhere in, uh, in, in the Indian state, I don't see much uh, in the way of, of, of concessions, uh, democratic concessions and things like that. Although that there's, there's very much activism on the ground and there's very much uh, going on calling for confidence building measures, calling for um, increased communication and for these concessions. So in terms of, of solution, um, yes, this is very much complicated by the broader geopolitical dynamics of, of Pakistan and China um, as well, but I'm, I, I'm not gonna really prognosticate, I'm just going to con convey a sense of, uh, of fear and a little bit of worry uh, on the part of Kashmir. For the, the um, territorial issue, I, I entirely agree, but again, it's, it's kind of written onto the, um, the, the fabric of the state making process. But if you can look at the documents, the manifestos written by the BJP, um, they telegraph that this was what they were intending to do. Uh, it's written onto the ways that they were speaking about Kashmir as integral to India, as uh, an essential part of India. So that for many who were listening to the BJP's um, discourse on Kashmir, uh, 5th of August, 2019, was not entirely surprising, although it did mark a, a huge step um, towards the further consolidation of uh, Indian rule. Within that, I, I do need to extend the argument, considering that it, uh, we're just subscribing to the Indian side and the major dimensions that we're discussing right now uh, tend to focus more on how the Indians did have a plan and they're just waiting for the opportune moment to execute that plan uh, and how this demographic change inside Kashmir is going to have an effect uh, and how India would then be executing this demographic change within, within Kashmir as a sign to... Uh, in consonance with the United Nations resolution that if and when the situation is stable for a plebiscite, it shall be conducted. So India might be doing what it's trying to do, strong arm its way into uh, a plebiscite that favors its particular discourse. But then I need to dial it uh, a little back. Ever since August 5th, 2019, there has been a shift in the Indian consideration and that consideration has now moved towards Gilgit Baltistan. And the idea postulated by the Indians was that we're not really talking about Kashmir as the valley per se, but the argument that we have is about the principality of Kashmir in Toto. The idea that Kashmir or the empire of Kashmir under the Gulab Singh family uh, 
is not really restricted or refrained to what you call as the Indian occupied Kashmir or the Pakistani administered side of Kashmir, but it's a very large body of uh, uh, territory and a very different kind of a population. And we lay claim to all of it. Now that raises the stakes to another level. So you're really creating this anti quo situation where you're trying to somehow justify that one legal document, which is disputed between two state parties, holds consonance because of a political action. And this debate in no small measure is political in its construction. It's really very legal. And if the idea, if I, if I do subscribe to the documents made on Kashmir and I say that this debate genuinely is legal, then the legality of this discourse is not really available to us ever since 3rd June 1947. So if you look at the British and they're winding their uh, business here up in the subcontinent, the interest they have into the legal dimension insofar as the princely states are concerned, that it was a very simple line in 3rd June 1947. Princely states are responsible for conducting their own affairs within the sovereignty of the subcontinent and beyond the dominion. Now, the idea that princely states did have a very different ethnic composition, where some rulers were Muslim by, by, by religion and their ethnicity in Punjabi, but they were in a very foreign land occupied by a territory that was not subscribing to their religion. This problem was something of a vacuum that was left in. And the, uh, I, I not call it haste, but the way in which the subcontinent was declared independent or the way it was divided up between the two stakeholders, uh, that's where the legal problem for me comes up. The idea that human rights violations, uh, a lot of questions are directed towards that in the chat. The reason why human rights violations are not called human rights violations by India is not because they do not accept what they're doing is wrong, but because they're able to turn your head to other human rights violations occurring anywhere else on the planet. So the idea is that if somebody points a finger to them and says that you're conducting a human rights violation, Indians say that a similar kind of a human rights violation is currently being conducted in Nairobi. So the idea that you raised or the issue that you discussed that the ethnic side of Kashmir or the humanitarian angle, the social angle of Kashmir is more important than the geopolitical angle is something which is very important. But then it's not really very popular among the stakeholders that are dealing with Kashmir or the third party interveners that have been interlocutors in settling the Kashmir dispute between Pakistan and India. And that is where this entire debate gets really messy. It becomes very confusing that for Pakistan, it's a very different angle. Pakistan looks at Kashmir from five different lenses, humanitarian, territorial, social, independence orientations, and political. But then if you ask Pakistan to take a choice as to which one is their priority, that's where Pakistan gets confused. But for India, it's a conglomerate of all of these problems, plus legal, because it's part of their constitution. So when you talk to India, India says that, look, this is a very uh, complex issue for you, but it's very simple for us. It's a territory earmarked in our constitution. And our constitution is the repository of sovereignty and that's where I lead the argument to the post Versailles issue that states and nations are the only two stakeholders to any solution of a conflict or interpretation of a conflict in a given scenario. India takes that challenge and hallmarks it to, to do whatever it's trying to do in Kashmir. That's where the complication comes in. That's where I have a question in my mind that for the international community, the only complication with Kashmir is that since it does not infringe them directly, the United Nations on one side, the United States of America on the other, and the sensitivity of nuclear flashpoint of Kashmir, the actual geopolitical issue of Kashmir, is so serious among two stakeholders, stakeholders that our intervention may somehow complicate the problem further and encourage escalation rather than de-escalating. That's what we saw in the Kargil issue that instead of looking at what did happen at Kargil, the idea was to somehow push Pakistan and India to a point where they no longer escalate to a point of no return. The mutually assured destruction scenario maintained by nuclear weapon states. And that's where my question comes up. When do you think in, in your dissertation, when do you think we started ignoring Kashmir from a socio-political angle and started focusing on Kashmir as a purely geopolitical construct? 
it's it's interesting and that i think that you hit on a very um important vein of scholarship but that's the dominant way in which it's been framed uh if you look at even going back to the 1950s uh joseph corbell who wrote the danger in kashmir in 1950s uh established the corbell school at uh, international relations at the university of denver um wrote at about kashmir as a geopolitical issue um, and then even before independence, this is how it was framed by Olaf Caro and also by the ambassadors to the, uh, the United States. We're trying to get the United States to look at this as um, a broader kind of geopolitical angle and not necessarily at the, the social level. Um, but as you mentioned, this the, the stakes are very different depending on which lens you look at, how far you zoom in or zoom out. Um, at the social level, one of the things that's going on is a real fear that there's going to be a similar project to what the Chinese have done in Xinjiang or Tibet with um, th these demographic shifts that are going to be uh, forcibly uh, implemented over, over the area. So um, again, the, the issues and the stakes are different. Um, there are different uh, foci that I think that you hit on uh, perfectly, whether this be the nuclear level or whether this be territorial um, lines, you know, go on or, or wherever. Um, but the occupation, again, the, the more that these get exacerbated, the, the more tense the relations get, there's going to be a direct correlation between that and the occupying, the number of occupying forces and the measures that are implemented over the valley itself on the social level. So the, there's, there's kind of a, that's the more kind of determining of the two, um, I believe, uh, um, more influential of the two aspects is as the geopolitics get more tense, so does the, the humanitarian situation. Um, it, it, yeah, so I think that's the best way I can probably respond. That's principally where the line of control becomes really controversial. Because when we say Indian occupied Kashmir on our side here in Pakistan, India calls Azad Kashmir or the Pakistani administered Kashmir as the Pakistani occupied Kashmir on the other end. And this, uh, I call it a myopia of, of observation that beyond the idea that one state has physically occupied the other uh, territory between the two states causes a, that legitimacy concern that I've been talking about when we look at the Kashmir issue from an international legal lens, that when you're trying to bring two parties to sit down together to solve a problem, but they have this preconceived notion that this territory actually belongs to me, maybe partly because I have physical control over it versus I have constitutional control over it. That's where this issue really becomes a very big problem. Now, uh, a lot of questions were directed to us as far as the solution to the problem is concerned. And I'd like to uh, take a shot at it. Uh, in the sense that when you look at uh, the idea of Kashmir and you look at the ethnicities in Kashmir and you look at the territorial position on which Kashmir is versus when you look at the, uh, I, I'd call it a re natural resource value of the territory of Kashmir or the strategic necessity of the land of Kashmir as far as access to the adversary is concerned. Solving the Kashmir dispute between two states that have somehow politically acquiesced to the fact that they are enemies and they will remain enemies for years and decades to come. The idea of selling the narrative of an independent Kashmir or bringing in a third stakeholder of the Kashmiri population as an independent voice in this particular problem has more bad than good. Because then if you have a third party that is of the view that they need to be separately dealt with uh, from Pakistan and India allows Pakistan and India to impress on that particular territory more aggressively. And that causes more problems than it solves. And, and that's my two cents on this particular issue that if the solutions are the ones that we've been practicing since 1947, without discussing between one another before we talk to the Kashmiris as to what they want, the ends of those particular discussions would remain the same. Thank you so much, Professor Kazi. Um, so I think the other, um, there was a lot of questions, I think, of course, regarding, um, I mean, there's just a lot in the chat. Um, I think there, generally, you see the sentiment from um, scholars here in Pakistan, the fact that uh, they feel that Pakistan, for the most part, is 
the issue of Kashmir is not taken um, as seriously by the international community, or it's not something that is focused on in terms of the human, you know, the humanitarian situation. Um, so I think that's a that's generally a sentiment that you know has come through in the chats. Um, one of the other questions that was interesting um, was um, by uh, a professor, uh, Sarah Halverson. And so she asked another question, thinking about the geopolitics of Kashmir. Um, we live in the age of climate, uh, climate change. Uh, and that's affecting particularly sort of some of these um, uh, more unique environments that are very um, uh, sort of at the at the border of the, the the changing of the climate, and Kashmir is one of these places. Um, you're seeing glaciers that are melting. Um, you're seeing a lot of changes that are taking place, sort of in the environmental um, capacity of even the land to produce. Um, so, what role do you see, say, the next twenty or thirty years of climate change having in the way that um, the politics of Kashmir is going to evolve? Uh, environmental uh, security it. isn't entirely uh, my forte, but I'll, I'll try to take um, uh, an approach here. Um, it was interesting during the floods that happened a few years ago in Kashmir, how in many ways the Indian state tried to um, make aid uh, contingent in different ways. So ways in which um, help was conditional on um, you know certain forms of, of reception by um, by Kashmiris and the way that this was framed broader to the the media um, within India that this was circulated as heroic uh, you know Indian forces going in and helping out Kashmiris um, but the water issue, I believe, and, and flooding, which will uh, inevitably result uh, being major issues there and the way in which that is weaponized as uh, a means of assistance to uh, people in, in Kashmir um, themselves. I think that that's, that's probably the, you know, the, the best way I could approach that is just looking at what happened during the floods a few years ago. Now, if, if, if I get into it, Sarah, your question has a very, uh, it has a different dimension. Uh, should these things play a role in constructively bringing Pakistan and India together to solving the Kashmir issue? Would these uh, natural resources or climate change issues bring these two countries together and the good argument? So there are three dimensions to your question. Over the last two decades, we've seen that Pakistan, in the wake of a flood, usually in the political landscape, has always cried wolf, stating that India has intentionally done so in specific rivers to upset Pakistan's developmental phases towards a more secure economic future. And the same idea, as far as Kashmir is concerned, that if in, in India, if we give this particular piece of territory to Pakistan, they will just choke us dry. Now, if this is the political sentiment and non-traditional security measures are looked into from the lens of traditional security, add political rhetoric to that, you have what we live every day here in Pakistan and India. And this situation does not see climate change, water security or non-traditional human security challenges as non-traditional security challenges, but as an extension to traditional security political outreach between the two countries as far as the political landscape is concerned. And that traditionalism is really the bigger problem. So when you look at the COVID-19 environment here in South Asia, and Pakistan wants to offer oxygen cylinders to India because it has a shortage, we see that the Indian government refuses it on the premise that it does not wish to conduct such transactions. And it has sufficient capability of producing oxygen and supplying it to its own people uh, with, with a lot of convenience. So when you see two states uh, displaying such levels of inflexibility, the idea of, yes, using non-traditional security challenges to bind them together is theoretically possible, but practically to bring them these, these two states together, that will be a very difficult challenge. 
because composite dialogue program in the Indu, Indu Kumar Gujral dot trying uh, essentially failed because there was this lack of political will and this lack of political efficacy to have a conversation with one another maybe because we still think we're not ready here in Pakistan and India and this idea that we're not really ready to have a conversation let alone have a mutually agreed upon stance on certain uh, controversial issues that have been there since our uh, inception. And then Kashmir, which is declared as an existential threat for Pakistan and India, uh, the, the solution of the, of the issue, if it goes either way, to bring these two states from traditional realm of thinking to a non-traditional realm is something that would be very difficult. But yes, if the push does come to shove, it could be a very good segue in bringing these two states to sit down and talk about the future of Kashmir. Wonderful, thank you. So we have uh, someone who wants to ask a live question. Uh, Kaiser Javed, um, would you like to um, ask a question? Uh, uh, thank you for um, uh, having me in. C uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Thank, thank you. Uh, so my question is that uh, 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 one of the speaker talked about uh, uh, the uh, annexation with India on the 26th October with Maharaja did, who was a monarch. Uh, but uh, there was, uh, it was a, a contingent, uh, or you can say, uh, uh, it was uh, it was done after the uh, tribal invasion of 22 October. Uh, uh, which were taken place, uh, but we forget to mention that uh, it is the important point. Uh, uh, I wanted to uh, have your uh, review on it because I think that that invasion was the main point which created this conflict. Uh, because uh, b before that invasion of 22 uh, October, which was a tribal attack, uh, Maharaja signed standstill agreement with uh, Pakistan and Pakistan did sign it back, but India didn't sign it. Uh, they were saying that uh, they paused it, but uh, later on when uh, Maharaja went for annexation with India and he, he asked to support that to uh, fight back with the, the tribal attack, they, uh, Nehru said that uh, you have to annex uh, with India and then we will help you. Uh, uh, that is the one point. You, uh, I just want to hear some comments from your side on this. And the second point. Uh, which I want to raise is that uh, 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 Gilgit Pakistan is part of state of Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, what India did on 5 October 19, uh, uh, 2019, uh, Pakistan uh, also abrogated state subject in uh, uh, Gilgit Baltistan in, 1970, in 1970s. So uh, uh, we, uh, India always used this uh, tactic, or you can say all, always use this argument that Pakistan did this, so we are going to do that. As we have seen that in 1984, when there was uh, armed struggle in India, uh, and there was a lot of uh, 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 mili uh, militants which went from Pakistan, like Jashi Muhammad, lashkar e toiba and uh, uh, Harkatul Mujahideen was uh, uh, indigenous struggle, but they were used, uh, they were exploited religiously to fight for Pakistan. So how do you see these interventions from Pakistani side and how, uh, of course, India is doing worse with Kashmiris, but we cannot um, uh, just uh, look away from these interventions. Thank you. I can speak more directly to um, how these have affected uh, things in the um, Indian administered uh, Kashmiris. That's kind of my major focus of research and uh, major professor, maybe Professor Kazi can uh, uh, speak to the Pakistani side, but with respect to the first of um, your two um, questions, on um, I think if we focus less on the legal issue than some of the social and uh, economic and political issues that were taking place in uh, around this period of um, 1947, because you are right about the standstill agreements and um, those being signed by Pakistan and not by India and all that. Again, that's more of a legal matter, and again, the legal legality of the uh, monarch to be able to accede to uh, India and whether this be, you know, by fiat, uh, essentially. And there's also issues with like the, the dating and things like that. But um, the invasion by the, um, what, were called, what was called the tribal invasion and the Pashtun invasion um, of the 22nd of October came on the back of 
uh, an ethnic cleansing campaign by the Dogra state in uh, what's now the um, uh, like Pakistani administered Jammu uh, part of the state. So the area around Rawalkot and Punch um, had undergone an ethnic cleansing campaign against the popular agitation against the Dogra monarch, uh, which is usually alighted from the history, but in part to uh, aid that rebellion against the Dogras, uh, that, that's what kind of prompted um, the, um, the invasion from what was then the, the Northwest uh, Frontier Provinces, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Um, and uh, regarding um, the Pakistani um, impact on, uh, on Kashmir, just um, uh, more broadly again, so I, I spoke to the fact that when tensions ramp up, usually this spells a greater um, impetus for control over the, uh, the Indian administered uh, Kashmir Valley. Now, um, in general, how things had worked with different militant outfits is that they were used to um, kind of counterbalance uh, one from becoming too strong or, or um, having different levels of uh, patronage. Um, so the, that, that had been done when Jammu and Kashmir Liberation Front had been making uh, you know, increasing strides and calls for uh, independence in the early 90s and were pretty dominant kind of um, outfits there. Um, but many Kashmiris who do uh, sign on to, whether it be Lashkar Taiba or Jaish Muhammad, it does, they don't really sign on to the ideological program so much as they're signing on to this element of resistance and all of the kind of social capital that comes along uh, with being part of a, of, a mil of a militant outfit. So it's not that necessarily when you see Kashmiris signing on to certain programs that they're ideologically completely you know, committed, they may have a differing and uh, contending um, you know, motivations going on simultaneously. All right, um, thank you so much, Professor Liguori um, and Professor Kazi. Um, I guess we can take uh, one more question. Um, so there was one uh, question uh, in the chat. Um, how do the feelings of authenticity uh, by Professor Sen, uh, how did the feelings of authenticity and the subsequent evolution of a mixed local culture compare with claims to sovereignty? So how, how yeah, I mean, I guess kind of uh, drawing further, I don't know, um, Professor Sen, if you want to talk, uh, if you want to elaborate on your question. Oh, you have to unmute yourself. Is it okay, okay now? Yes, yes, go ahead. What I really mean is that, um, you know, people have always traveled and uh, gone to other places and the people who lived in those places uh, have always felt that they are the authentic um, representatives of this, that culture or the space. And uh, then eventually things get integrated and mixed and the local culture is created, it evolves. But at what point does the emergence of a local culture uh, substantiate the claim to sovereignty? Uh, are there any guidelines or should there be any guidelines that under such and such and such conditions or at such and such a stage in the evolution of a local culture, a state can claim sovereignty. I have the utmost respect for <laughs> the creation of a, of, for the idea of Kashmiri sovereignty. There is no doubt, but um, at what point can we say that, yes, this is justified. Uh, when a local culture, a heterogeneous culture has reached a certain stage of independence and in, you know, acquired more and more originality again, on the path to becoming an established culture, can we declare that yes, this state can now, this region can now claim so, uh, sovereignty. In any case, I do not believe in, in the creation of sovereign states. I believe they create more and more barriers, but I also understand that all nations have to uh, put down their claims to sovereignty in order for that sovereignty free uh, stage of culture 
of civilization to be born. But in order uh, to start on the process, we have to go one, somebody has to first volunteer that I do not claim, lay claim to sovereignty just because I have acquired uh, such a status or our people want such a status. Should there be a system of education in place? Should a system of guidelines be created to uh, judge such claims? Thank you, Professor Sun. Yeah, I think basically the question is, is that um, thinking in the age of the nation state, there are many groups and many societies, many nations, everybody, you know, um, I you know, it could also be possible that you can infinitely cut up, uh, con uh, you know, sort of nations that exist today into new countries, right? So at what point is there some sort of definition for when a society should have a state or when it has a right to a state or sort of so let's like kind of pull back a little bit and think more theoretically about at what point do um, you know can do we sort of think about um, subnational groups then making the claim for statehood and then uh, you know is there criteria or threshold for statehood I guess yeah. I think that's ultimately up to, um, you know, political power structures, both within the states and also at the broader level of the General Assembly, recognizing the United Nations General Assembly, recognizing such claims. Um, but you often see this being done in the forms of cultural projects. So the creation of Kashmiriyat, which uh, really um, is this project which projects a particular um, kind of symbiotic relationship between uh, Kashmiri Hindus and Kashmiri Muslims and really draws on a whole um, a whole bunch of different traditions of Kashmiri history, which uh, bring in to the four distinctive kind of Kashmiri uh, enunciations of Hindu histories and particular Kashmiri enunciations of Muslim histories to form this kind of composite kind of Kashmiri nationality. So th there's a lot of that work which has been done and which really you know, stresses the fact that it's Kashmiri, it's not necessarily Kashmiri Muslim or Kashmiri Hindu, but it's just distinctively Kashmiri history. Um, so, so on that, I'd, should something be done? Yeah, I, th I think so, but um, uh, I don't think that there's appropriate infrastructure in place for a genuine recognition of the developments that have been made in that vein at different areas. Because, um, but we can see, again, if we look at it closely, we can see a different degree of consolidation and crystallization of different identities in different areas. So that you might be able to see uh, that more in the Kashmiri case and less in uh, maybe another subnationality case. Um, All right. Well, I'll turn it over to Professor Kazi for the last word of our session. If if you really dissect Professor Karabi's discussion uh, as to how a state would be willing to get rid of this this desire to homogenize and then still maintain its heterogeneity and then identify itself to a specific identity, that requires a lot of changes within your political culture. And what we've seen in the trajectory of political cultures here in South Asia is that identification uh, of homogeneity, whether it's religious, whether it's sectarian, whether it's cultural, is something that has really, really become a populist slogan for the last few decades. And then to ask this homogenized, not really in essence, but in theory, this homogenized population to accept its diversity in an environment where diversity can be crushed by state use of force and power. That's what we saw in Gujarat massacre when the current prime minister of India was the chief minister back then that if there is this existence of a separate identity and that identity wants to make itself known, recognized and then be part of the political structure, that's how social uh, ideologies or social structures change the political culture of a given ethnicity. To have that massively crushed, aggressively put down, that's what the history of Kashmir is since 1947. The homogenization of Kashmir as the Indian uh, union as part of the union is where the problem is 
And if I may take license, that's maybe the problem here in Pakistan as well. To have this supercharged, politically very volatile public, uh, homogenized through force, talk about diversity, uh, it's desirable, but it's really, really tumultuous for them to move on to that dimension. And yes, it would take decades for us to reach that point. Europeans learned from First World and the Second World War not to fight any other wars. Maybe the problem is that subscribing to the Western literature too much, Pakistan and India somehow are really waiting for their own world war to occur before they learn the lessons that they're supposed to learn. That's where Kashmir is a flashpoint. And that's where we're afraid. Uh, very profound thoughts. Thank you, Professor Kazi. I really appreciate that. Um, Professor Lagori, thank you again um, so much for, for joining us. Um, Professor Kazi, um, uh, Professor Iram at the University of the Punjab uh, Political Science Department, and particularly for all of the participants, the wonderful questions that you've asked uh, and your comments in the chat. We really appreciate you helping us to think through these very important questions and also to be able to bridge the, um, the gap of societies that um, Pakistan and America and scholars around the world have a lot to say to each other. Um, and these opportunities are very important that we approach and try to understand the situation, not just from other perspectives, um, but from also a, a type of um, knowledge equality, right? That we all have equal types of knowledge, different, different perspectives, but that they're all valuable and important in the larger discussion of how we understand the world. So I wanted to thank you all again for joining. Um, and just to remind you, that uh, tomorrow's lecture is going to be by Professor Ronald Cox, uh, who's gonna be talking about class conflict in globalization and the discussion from the University of Punjab will be Professor Gulshan Majid. So I hope that you are able to join us for tomorrow's lecture um, and we will prepare uh, all of these recordings uh, and send them to you um, at the end of next week once we conclude all of our sessions. So a wonderful uh, morning or evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you again for joining and uh, hope to see you again tomorrow. Take care.